Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today, we conclude the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. We come today to Luke chapter 24, and we will resume our study in verse 18. So get your Bible. Open it up to Luke 24, and uh, we'll begin in just a minute. <clears throat> the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Don't forget, you can study the whole Bible anytime you want, just exactly the way we're going to do it today. At your pace, at your convenience, click and listen to whichever, whichever um, series through the Bible, and there's three to choose from. Whatever book, whatever chapter, it's there for you at the Bible, verse by verse, dot com. And Father, we ask your blessings on this final study in the book of Luke, and that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I really hate to see this study in Luke come to an end. I've been savoring every moment of it. I've been enjoying and trying to savor every single verse. And today we're going to finish on a good note, looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, continuing to look at that. So let's read verse 18. And one of them, now he's talking about two men that it's Resurrection Sunday, two disciples decided that they were going to leave Jerusalem, to kind of gave up on the whole Jesus thing, and they started to walk home to the city of Emmaus. They're walking, they're talking, they're discouraged, they're sad, talking about all the events of the previous few days concerning Jesus, none of it any good, except for that word that they didn't really believe that he was raised from the dead. Obviously, they didn't believe it or they wouldn't be walking home. They would have stayed in Jerusalem. And Jesus shows up and joins their little walk. And let's look at verse 18. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only, he's talking to Jesus, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? So, if anyone in Jerusalem was talking about anything, they were talking about the events surrounding the betrayal, the trial, and the murder of Jesus Christ. He was the most popular person in the entire country with the masses up until a couple of days ago. So that was the top news story. 19, and he said unto them, what things? Jesus is plain stupid because he wants them to talk about it. He says, what things? What are you talking about? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. See, they didn't recognize him. Remember, the Bible says that God withheld their ability to recognize who Jesus was because of what I said last time. Jesus has an awful lot to teach these people from the Word of God. And if he reveals himself, they're not going to hear a word that he says. And he doesn't want their faith to be in experience, but rather in the Word of God. So, again, he said unto them what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. And how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. I don't know if I said this last week or not, or last time. But if there had been any respect for the religious rulers among these godly men, it was out the window after what they did to Christ. Verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. 
If hope deferred makes the heart sick, as the Bible says it does, then hope lost is a dagger through the heart. And that is what these people, these two men were experiencing, hope lost. These disciples went from waiting and expecting Christ to set Israel free to believing with all their hearts that it'll never happen because he's dead. And that's why they are sick with sadness. 22. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And then when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Okay, so these two men, along with the other disciples and the apostles, they have the testimony of the scriptures, which said that Jesus would be raised. They have the testimony of the women who went to the tomb and said they saw the angels. They have the testimony of the angels. They have the testimony of Jesus himself, who said he would be back in three days. All these people testify, all these things and these people testifying to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They are without excuse for not believing. 24. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Peter, or, yeah, Peter and John ran to the sepulcher after hearing what the lady said about the angel who they saw there. But they didn't see Jesus, just the empty tomb. And here's the problem. They figured, these two men and the rest of the apostles and disciples figured, they assumed that if Christ had really been raised, then he certainly would have revealed himself to his disciples when they went to the empty tomb. And since he did not do that, they don't believe that he's raised, and they are continually sad. You know, God is not obliged to confirm that something is true by doing something that we want him to do as proof. The thing may be true, and if it's according to Scripture, it is true, as was the resurrection. The thing may be true, but God may ignore what we feel must be there as proof. So they set up this standard. Now, if this happens, and if this happens, and we assume this would be happening, then we would believe that it's true. Well, you already have the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of Jesus. You shouldn't need any assumptions on your part that this should happen or that should happen if it's truly real. And so, because they didn't believe the scriptures, they didn't believe Jesus, they didn't believe the word of God, they continue to be sad. Good way to waste your life. 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Notice what Jesus rebukes them for, that they were slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He rebukes them for not believing the word of God. Good people can be wrong. So Christ did not rebuke these disciples for not believing the women. But Jesus does rebuke them for not believing the Holy Scriptures, which are never wrong. 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Many places in the Old Testament talk about Christ dying for our sins. Instead of seeing the death of Jesus as evidence that Jesus wasn't the Christ, they should have seen it as another sign that he is the Christ. Again, they didn't use scripture as the guide for their thinking and their reasoning. <clears throat> That's why Jesus ought not you believe what the prophet said? 27. 
and beginning, and look at this, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures concerning, scriptures, the things concerning himself. So there you have it. This is the big lesson, the big Bible teaching that Jesus has for these guys. This is why he kept them from recognizing him because he had to teach them from the scripture. And boy, did he give them a Bible study here. The truth is going to sink in this time too. They're going to understand it because they lived it. And the scripture is going to make sense as Jesus explains it because it's going to coincide with everything that these people have experienced. Notice 28. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. Of course, Jesus would not invite himself to stay with these two men. He's not that type of a God. And at first he was not invited. And so being the polite, modest person that Jesus is, he just kept walking. They were turning off the exit, and he just kept going. <clears throat> Verse 29. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Jesus does not force himself on anyone. He will let people carry on in their lives without him. But he will also say yes to any invitation from anyone who really wants his company. So he said yes. Verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. <clears throat> Jesus said the prayer. Jesus distributed the food. He takes the spiritual lead as if he owned the place. Even though as far as they knew, he was a stranger. Why is he taking the lead in blessing the bread and distributing it? It's our house. We're the head of the household and Jesus just takes it upon himself to do that. 31. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Jesus' mission to these two men was accomplished. They needed to know from the scripture that he would be raised, and that that scripture came to pass, and he was raised. They needed to know that. And what convinced him? He didn't reveal himself to them. His words which were from the word of God, convinced them. Well, his disappearing put an exclamation mark behind his words, but it was his words that convinced them. 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scripture? See, they, had the, they did have a love for the word of God. And they did have a hunger for truth, and that's why the Word of God burned within them. You know, if you're talking on the telephone with a close friend, you know that it's them without actually seeing them, right? You recognize them by their words. You recognize them by their personality. You just recognize them without even seeing them physically. And these two men did not recognize Jesus' body, but they recognized his soul through the words that he spoke. They had the testimony of his words and the words that he taught, the words of Scripture, and it burned in their hearts. They knew it. 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And found the eleven gathered together, 
and them that were with them. All their plans in Emmaus are canceled after they saw and recognized Jesus. Whatever they had planned was canceled. Whatever reason they went back home to Emmaus for is gone. The thoughts of the thoughts of going back to the life that they had before Christ was probably canceled as well. The resurrection is huge. And they're probably wondering, what next? What does this mean for us? They're not interested in going back to their jobs or even going back to their hometown. 34. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. So by the time these two guys got back to Jerusalem, the resurrection was already old news to the other apostles and disciples because Jesus had already beat them back. And he appeared to Peter. Jesus beat these two disciples who left immediately for Jerusalem. Jesus beat them back to Jerusalem and had time to appear to Peter and reveal himself to him. Which tells me that people are going to move a whole lot faster in their raised bodies than what they do today. So Jesus clearly left these two men in the dust. And he got back long before they did. 35. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. The apostles told their story. And then these two disciples told their story. And as a result, everyone's faith was no doubt strengthened and confirmed. When Christians talk about their experiences with God, when Christians talk about God, about the Word of God, about what God has done for them, you know what it's like? It's like reliving those experiences all over again. And everyone who's involved in the conversation gets a fresh blessing. That's the importance of fellowshipping with other Christians who love God's word. 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, there's a surprise visit that they didn't expect. Without opening the door, without even hearing the footsteps of Jesus Christ, Suddenly, he was there behind closed doors with all of his disciples. The resurrection body worked real good. A resurrected body like that would never work in this world of sin because people would use it to do all sorts of evil. But it'll be fine in a world where everyone respects each other because no one sins anymore, that's the new heavens and the new earth. It won't be a problem that you can appear and disappear because no one's going to sin. Nobody's going to use it to their advantage in an evil way. 37. But they were terrified and affrightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. The disciples mistook Christ for a ghost at first departed souls are not roaming the earth tossing plates and slamming doors in people's homes today those are not I know there's a lot of stuff on TV nowadays and probably a lot of books and all this stuff about ghosts and hauntings and all this stuff you know doors slamming and things flying across the room and this and that those are not the spirits of departed people, my friends. Any spirit that claims to be a human spirit who is doing those sorts of things is a demon in disguise. But, like many people today, the disciples believed in ghosts. And they believed Jesus was a ghost. Notice 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? 
they are troubled because they mistakenly believe that Jesus is a spirit. It was a mistake. They believed the wrong thing. He's a ghost. That's why they were troubled. Most fear is a waste of time because it is fear over things that are not true or things that will never happen. A mind controlled by the flesh, by the sin nature, and influenced by that sin nature or Satan can become like a production studio for horror stories and drive people to the point of despair. And it's fantasy. Much of it is fantasy. 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. A spirit doesn't have anything that can be touched. We are spirits. But for all eternity, we will be like Christ. We will be in our physical bodies that have been raised. Jesus is not a spirit. Well, he's a spirit, but he's in a body. God is spirit, but he's in that body. Just like you and I are spirits, but we are in a body. He was not a ghost. His resurrection was 100% physical. 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. The nail scars, obviously, is what he showed them. The nail scars are proof that it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his physical body, Back from the dead. Acts 1 3 says this. It says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And what you see right here is just one of those times, one of those proofs. 41. And while they yet believed not for joy, he wondered and wondered, I should say. He said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. This will, this will convince them. Jesus asked for some food. And I don't think he was hungry. He certainly did not need food. But he ate it in order to show them that it was really him in a physical body. And I bet you that fish and that honeycomb, he had fish for supper and honeycomb for dessert. You're going to be eating supper and dessert in your resurrected body, and I bet it's going to taste better than ever. So notice that. One of the reasons I love this chapter is that it shows us what we're going to be like in our resurrected bodies. And one of the things we're going to be able to do is talk like he did, be touched like he was, eat like he did. I like that. Verse 43. And he took it and did eat before them. And it didn't fall to the ground. He didn't, he didn't put that food in his mouth and, and then fell right through his body to the ground. It didn't do that because he wasn't a spirit. He was physical. His resurrection was physical. And you and I, as I said, as Christians, are going to eat in our resurrected bodies. Not because we will need food. I don't think we're going to need food, but simply for enjoyment. And oh, we're going to enjoy it. No matter what we eat, it's going to taste good. Whatever food it might be, because our taste buds are going to be glorified too. Everything's going to be enhanced to perfection, the way God wanted it to be in the beginning. Food will be one of the things that will enhance our enjoyment of eternity. I like that because it gives me something concrete to cling to about eternity, what it will be like. 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. <clears throat> the, cru the crucifixion would not have shocked them if they would have understood that the Bible predicted it. See, the more we know about the Word of God, the better we will understand the ways of God. The more we know the Bible, the less likely we are to be surprised at some of the th things that God does and some of the things that God allows. It all comes down to knowing the Word of God. 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. It takes a, a work of God and a work of grace to remove the veil of a person's mind so that they can understand the true meaning of the Bible. That's why prayer ought to always precede Bible reading and Bible study. 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Jesus had to be raised on the third day to show that he was sinless and to show that his sacrifice paid for our sins. And also because the Bible said it would happen. Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There is no forgiveness without repentance. And there is no forgiveness apart from Christ. And I certainly respect your right as a human being to exercise your free will and choose any religion or choose to be an atheist. That's your, that's your right as a human being. You have a free will, but I do not respect all religions. You have a right. I respect that, but I don't respect all religions. The only religion worthy of respect is the one that acknowledges that Jesus died for our sins and forgiveness is only found through Christ. 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Jesus doesn't appear to every human being in a raised body. He doesn't appear to every human being in a raised body to give them a chance to believe. He appeared to his apostles and he told them to be witnesses of those truths. And we know they spoke the truth about the resurrection because all 11 of them suffered torture and death for proclaiming it. 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. They will receive power from on high. They will receive the Holy Spirit in a few days, and he will empower them so that they can preach the word of God with boldness. 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. When Jesus lifted up his hands toward the disciples, he spoke words of blessing. And then it says in verse 51, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted out of away from them. He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So the last thing that Jesus did, in fact, even as he was leaving, he was blessing his disciples. The last memory they had of Christ was his outstretched arms blessing them as he went up. 52. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. When they saw Christ lift off, they worshipped. No one had to say it's time for worship. You know, when you know in your soul who Jesus is and what he has done, then you're going to worship before you even know you're worshiping. Out of time. For this study in this book, continue studying the Word of God with me verse by verse at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at the thebibleversebyverse.com. As always, if you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me, pray for the Word. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page at the thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Let's get out God's word together, verse by verse, the whole counsel of God as it should be done. Again, that's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Thanks for studying the 
Gospel of Luke. I'll see you in the Gospel of John next time.